Welcome to Ion Africa. I'm Clarisse Fortuné. First, the headlines. Two people killed in Tumbuktu a month after a jihadist group has declared war in a region. Thousands of inhabitants are now basically cut off from the world and basic necessities are beginning to run short. Search and rescue teams continue to look for missing people in the flood-stricken Libyan city of Derna, 10 days after two dams collapsed, killing thousands. He's an inspiration for many scientists, and now a book has been released about Professor Jean-Jacques Mouyembe. He's known for his work on the Ebola virus and COVID. The author is hoping that more Congolese will follow in his footsteps. At least two people have been killed in Tobuktu in the north of Mali after a jihadist attack on Thursday. The city has been blockaded by the jihadist alliance for the past month. Cut off from the rest of the country, residents live with fear and basic necessities are running short. Camille Knight and Ludovic de Foucault report. It started with a declaration of war in the Timbuktu region, announced early August through audio messages by the Al-Qaeda Jihadist Alliance, known as the Support Group for Islam and Muslims. Over a month later, it's clear that it was more than an intimidation tactic. Mali's military says two people were killed and five injured in shelling on Thursday afternoon. The town has been under siege for weeks, inhabitants are cut off from the rest of the world and basic goods are in short supply. The market is really struggling at the moment. If this continues, a lot of shops are going to have to close. Because if basic goods don't come in, like oil, milk, sugar or rice, it's going to be very hard on the population. The Niger River that flows a few kilometres south of Timbuktu was once a vital artery linking the city to other towns. But an attack on a ferry early this month that killed dozens of people has put an end to any transport along that route. Meanwhile, Sky Mali, the only airline to still fly planes to Timbuktu, cancelled its flights after a shell attack not far from the airport. Today, we can really say that the situation is unbearable. The people of Timbuktu are suffering. This is a real cry from the heart. Jihadist forces are strengthening their grip on rural areas. And they're not alone. The withdrawal of French troops and UN missions has also revived the threat of an offensive led by Tuareg and Arab separatist groups. And to Libya next, where search and rescue teams continue to look for missing people in a flood-stricken city of Derna. This 10 days, after, 10 days after two dams collapsed during Storm Daniel, killing thousands. Search dogs are being used to find those who might still be buried under the rubble. Antonia Currigan reports. Once a bustling economic hub, the port of Derna is now a shrine to the countless killed by Storm Daniel, and the harbour itself their graveyard. With thousands dead, 10,000 more are thought to be missing, and search teams have been mobilised in the port. The port is divided into sectors. A specific team has been assigned to each area, with a leader for each team, even the divers. After the storm caused two dams to burst, unleashing a deluge that swept whole neighbourhoods out to sea. A car and a body were swept away. People were screaming, but we couldn't do anything. My neighbor pulled two children onto his balcony and brought them into his house. Some of the people the flood swept away were alive, but others were already dead. There was nothing we could do. Of those who survived, an estimated 43,000 have been driven away from the region due to lack of drinking water. This week saw outrage from residents, calling for an investigation into the disaster after multiple warnings that the dams were not fit for purpose went unheeded. The war in Sudan could spread beyond the northeast African country's borders if not stopped. A warning from Sudan's army chief addressing the United Nations General Assembly. Abdel Fattah al-Burhan also urged world leaders to designate the rival paramilitary rapid support forces as a terrorist group. We call on you, Mr. President, and the international community to consider these forces and the groups allied with them as terrorist groups. 
Everyone must stand up to them and fight them to protect the Sudanese people. The danger of this war is now a threat to regional and international peace and security. As those rebels have sought the support of outlaws and terrorist groups from different countries in the region and the world. Our regional correspondent Bastien Renouille gives his analysis. During his speech, General Brian accused the rapid support forces of being responsible of the ongoing conflict in Sudan. But he forgot to say that it's not a war between a government and a rebel faction. Rather than that, it's a war between two men who want to remain in power. Uh, as uh, Volker Perters, former United Nations a Special Envoy for Sudan, explained uh, in front of the uh, Security Council, he said that uh, the two men decided to settle their conflict by fighting. Uh, Brian also accused the uh, rapid support forces of being responsible of the killings of hundreds of civilians, but he forgot to mention that the military are responsible as well since the army is bombing Khartoum and several other cities, killing hundreds, if not thousands, of civilians. And finally, he also said that he is ready to hand over the power to a civilian government after a transitional period if there is a peace agreement. But in Sudan, many do not believe him since he is behind the military coup that hosted a civilian prime minister in October 2021. So what is the goal of this speech well, to get more allies internationally. And at the same time, uh, General Hemeti, the head of the Rapid Support Forces, published a video on social networks trying to uh, counter the narrative of General Burhan. He said that he is ready as well for peace talks, but it's very difficult to believe these two men since uh, peace talks have been organized in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia during the past uh, few months. And since uh, now, none of the ceasefires that were announced were fully implemented. In 2017, Benin launched a school kitchen program to keep children in school. Over six years, the project grew with canteens serving 30% to 75% of schools. And Benin was named world champion of school catering by the World Food Program. Look at this report. Emmanuel Soji, Cynthia Egron and Priscilla Olympio. On her first day of school, Eliam makes her final preparations. This year, she'll no longer need to travel for miles to get lunch, thanks to the school's new canteen. She now has more time and energy to focus on her schoolwork, which had a positive impact on her grades. Her academic level has changed. She's now among the top five students in the class, which was not the case before. And since the canteen's opening in the school, located in Ungad, southwestern Benin, the number of enrollments has surged. The student body has increased by over 25 percent. Parents are relieved when they know their children can have at least one hot meal a day at school. 75 percent of state schools in Benin today have access to canteens, almost three times higher than in 2017, when the project started. The main focus of this government-led initiative is to provide food access to children from disadvantaged backgrounds. We saw that school dropouts were becoming a prevalent issue, with one of the biggest causes being the family's financial difficulties. These difficulties lead to children being unable to continue their education due to a lack of food and nutrition. With the help of the World Food Programme, the government aims to provide food for all schools by 2026. School gardens and local producers supply the canteen with food while local partners monitor the rations. Benin is currently considered a model, not only in Africa, but also globally when it comes to school meals. Many countries would benefit from sharing these experiences, so these are ongoing processes. The primary school dropout rate in Benin fell by 4% since the introduction of school canteens. There has been an outpouring of grief for the Afrobeat star Mobad. Nigerians marched in several states this week, pressing authorities to investigate his death. Police in Lagos said they had exhumed his body and conducted an autopsy. The 27-year-old singer died last week in a Lagos hospital in unclear circumstances. 
we came here just to let the government know that we came. We want justice for this guy. Hopefully, we are looking out for the government to serve justice, and I think the police are already working. So I think they should just put us through the process because we are all you. It can happen to any one of us. It can happen to my brother, and brutality should stop from all this legal labor. Professor Jean-Jacques Mouyembe is a scientific icon in DR Congo and the rest of the world. In the 1970s, he was part of the team that discovered the Ebola virus. Since then, he had led Congo's fight against COVID and the monkeypox epidemic, an inspiration for the next generation of Congolese biologists, like this young doctor who just published a book about the professor's career. Report by Aurélie Bazara Kibangula and Matt Livingston. Michel Mouvoudi flicks through the precious collection in his library. There is one book that he is particularly proud of, the one that he wrote. Jean-Jacques Muyembe, an inspirational person. This is a 136-page book. It's a biography of Jean-Jacques Muyembe, a famous virologist in the Democratic Republic of Congo, who helped discover the Ebola virus in the 1970s. I told myself this would be a good opportunity to highlight a role model, someone who could serve as an example to young people to show that you can succeed through effort and sacrifice in this country. The two men met at this research institute in Kinshasa. Professor Muyembe has been running his lab here for 25 years, and it's become something of a second home. <laughs> Highly respected by his peers, the professor has been called upon to coordinate the response to several epidemics, including Ebola and then COVID-19. He is now also leading the charge against the spread of the monkeypox virus. But the 81-year-old says that his most important battle is now to train the next generation of scientists. I am no longer alone. There are 30 of us now, specialized in a variety of diseases like sleeping sickness or malaria. To have a place like this in a country like this one, it's quite something. The institute has state-of-the-art equipment and expert staff who are proud of the work that they do alongside the professor. He has enabled us to have many partnerships and to train in new techniques. If we hadn't developed like this, we would be behind and we wouldn't be at the level we are at now. Their rigorous efforts have already paid off and have led to the rise of Congolese scientific expertise in tropical diseases crucial knowledge that boosts the country's ability to respond to more public health emergencies. And a bit of sport with the World Rugby Cup. After yesterday's dramatic game with Namibia losing to France and hurting his major player in the process, Africa's last chance is tomorrow. South Africa will face Ireland and the Springboks say they're ready to fight. We're not going to hold back. We'll go hard at them and we know for sure also they've got Scotland waiting for them. We've got Tonga waiting for us. So it's not going to be an easy game, but we, we are well prepared for it. And that's it for this edition of Eye on Africa. Thank you for watching and stay for, for, with us for more news.